So what would you say for a publisher type of website that might talk about the same topic every year? Mm -hmm. um, maybe the content's a little bit different, but it's largely the same conversation. Like let's say they're talking about a certain type of skincare treatment mm -hmm. and they talk about it in 2017 mm -hmm. and 2018 and 2019. Right. Do you think they should take the same piece of content and update it each year or should they have three different pages for that well, topic? If, if it's it depends on if it's an incremental change that happened, as in like if the skincare routine is pretty much the same as mm -hmm. it was last year, mm -hmm. um, you can maybe, maybe rephrase it a little bit, but I would say you update the existing page and sure. maybe just reposition it somewhere more prominently mm -hmm. on your website for the, for the visitors to see. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't create a new page that basically says the same thing, mm -hmm. because especially when they're really similar, mm -hmm. we might just think one is a duplication of the right, other and then right. canonicalize them together, no matter what you do in canonical tags. Hello and welcome to SEO Myth Busting. In this episode, my guest is Lily Ray, SEO Director at Path Interactive, and uh, we're gonna discuss an interesting topic that you might wanna learn more about. What is it that you brought for us today? We're gonna talk about if, if too much content is a good thing for SEO or not. <laughs> All right, so what is it that people believe about this? What is the questions that you keep hearing uh, and wonder about? Yeah, I think a lot of companies think that maybe content's good for SEO, so we should produce a lot of it because mm -hmm. it'll help us rank for a lot of different keywords. And maybe we should put out a new blog post every single week to the mm -hmm. point where they're their website has thousands of blog posts and maybe they're not performing really well. No. So I think a lot of people have a question about how much content should I really have and to what extent does this actually help my performance? Oh, that's a really good question. So I think just going back to the basics, your key is to provide information to your users, right? Um, how much content is good for that depends a little bit on what you're doing. If you're a new site, then sure, cover as much of the happenings that you can, but if your website is about a specific product, then there is only so much you can say about it. And right. just keeping rambling on in a single page is not helping you much. Right. So you would think that maybe having a blog that talks about industry updates or things that are relevant for that company is, are worthwhile, but yeah. maybe not to just produce content for the sake of producing content. Not, not for the sake of producing content. If you have something like, if you have a product that is very versatile and different users or different customers are using it in very different ways, mm -hmm. then this would be an interesting thing to pr provide, basically say like, oh, look, our product can be used for this, our product mm -hmm. can be used for that. But just for the sake of content, having that's basically the same as having light content or useless content, really. Right. And then you're just spending crawling and you're spending resources on things that are not performing much. Right. right. Is like the presence of a blog and showing Google that you're producing new content something that helps your performance overall as a, as a kind of site-wide factor? Not necessarily. I mean, it is not a site-wide factor, but uh, if, again, this is your blog or your website is about something that is basically happening on a regular basis or mm -hmm. has a lot of updates to it, then that can help you bring relevant content to users that would otherwise maybe not find to your website, especially mm -hmm. if your users don't know about what you're doing, then the blog that reports on current events or developments right. can actually help people understand that, oh, there's this company that does this interesting thing. Right. But it doesn't change your search performance or like ranking or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just providing something relevant and useful to users that mm -hmm. is gonna help you. Um, if you're just putting it out to have a blog or if you're just like, hey, we, we just have content that keeps updating and changing without actually giving value to mm -hmm. the user, then that's not helping you much. So if you have an older piece of content, would you recommend that if it's a high quality piece of content, do you need to go back in there and make updates or should you only do that when something significant has changed? I think you should update it if something significant has changed for mm -hmm. sure. Um, if nothing has really changed, what you can do instead is you can write something different, new content, mm -hmm. have a fresh piece of content and just link that other piece of content mm -hmm. to say like, hey, by the way, this is like referring, this is not about necessarily search um, relevancy or anything, but it's more helping the user understand that there is other interesting content for them and mm -hmm. it's keeping, keeping them on your website, making sure that they get the information they were looking for. Definitely. Is there any way that Google tells us if there's too much content or maybe that content's underperforming? Like, can we look at our crawl stats to figure that something mm. like that out? So crawl stats are a bad place to look at this because the fact that we are not crawling something again does not mean that we are thinking it's bad mm -hmm. or it's good uh, if we're crawling it often. 
What's more interesting would be to look at the performance report, for instance, in Search Console. If you are seeing that you get a lot of impressions, but not that many clicks, you might want to change something about the content. If you are getting a lot of clicks through it, but then you see in your analytics that actually not much action happens, mm -hmm. then you can ask yourself, is the traffic worth it? Or do right. I need to change my content there? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as too much content. It's just, again, think from the user's perspective, what is the thing that I want the user to understand? And is the user interested in spending time on a page where they need 27 minutes to read everything? Right. Yeah. You, you get to decide. Definitely. If there's a lot of content that's not necessarily performing well on the website, mm -hmm. could that be something that kind of brings down the overall trustworthiness or authority of the website from Google's perspective? That depends a bit on what is the reason for it not performing. If it's spammy content, mm -hmm. if it's very thin content, then that can bring you down a little bit in terms of uh, we might just spend crawl budget on pages that are in the end not performing or not even being indexed anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and you might actually want to avoid having spammy content and bad content, especially if you get penalties or mm -hmm. manual actions. Uh, you want to definitely clean up there. Right. But besides that, it is usually a good idea to see, oh, this piece of content really does not perform well. Mm -hmm. Let's take it down or at least change it, right? Sure. And what would you think for like companies that have something like a help center, where there's a lot of content that answers very specific questions, but maybe it's only one or two sentences per page, and maybe they have 500 pages of that nature? Mm. Would you say that's something that they should remain indexed on Google? or? How does Google treat those types of pages? That's a really good question. Um, that might be treated as light content, as like as thin content and not, not necessarily useful. I would try to group these things and, and structure them in a meaningful way. If it's mm -hmm. a question about a specific like range of products, then you can group all these questions together to one page. Mm -hmm. um, or if you have questions in the category of troubleshooting or operating the, the thing that you're trying to sell, um, try to group this together to have more dense and helpful pages in one go because how likely is it that I have exactly one question? Right. If I have one question, I might have a follow-up question mm -hmm. or I might have a similar question. So putting these all together is a good idea. So grouping it together. Mm. I think that's one common theme that we talk about mm -hmm. a lot in the SEO world now is kind of consolidation. Yes. So do you think there's a case to be made for one? Maybe you have two pieces of pretty similar content and they would be better as one single article. So Definitely. doing a lot of merging and redirecting. Definitely. That's Definitely. something that Google's kind of appreciative yeah. when we do yeah, those yeah, types yeah. of things. Uh, we have less crawling to do. That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, we also know where to send the users then. Mm -hmm. And then there's a chance that if you have similar things, that these come from organizational reasons, like mm -hmm. one department thinks about it and another department thinks about it and none of these two talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So if you consolidate that, you, you bundle more relevancy and information in one place, mm. and that makes it easier for us to figure out, oh yeah, this is a good site to check this out and, mm -hmm. and get the user this information, mm -hmm. uh, rather than cannibalizing each other or right. just like being duplication. And what about word count? SEOs are always asking, is word count a ranking factor, which I no. think Google's talked about quite a bit yeah, recently. Yeah, we, we've talked about this quite a lot, and uh, it's not a ranking factor. If you can say what the user needs to know in 50 words, that is fantastic. If you need 100 words, that's cool. If you need 2,000 words, that's also not uh, mm -hmm. absolutely acceptable. It's, again, about trying to figure out what's the intention. If you, if you see yourself repeating yourself multiple times and saying right. the same things over and over again in the same uh, document or on the same page, What's the point? Yeah. Well, let's say you're in a situation where you've written 500 words for a specific topic mm -hmm. or keyword that you're trying to rank mm -hmm. for, and you see all your competitors have 4,000 words or something like that. Even though word count's not technically a ranking <laughs> factor, that's probably a good indication that you need longer content, right? I mean, it depends. Just because other people are doing it doesn't mean that they're doing it right. Right. right? So if, if you see them, them rank high, that might not continue to be that way just mm -hmm. because they have a high word count. Um, again, try to understand what is it that the users need. Maybe the larger word count just accidentally hits the right bits of information that people are looking for and mm -hmm. actually fits the query intention of the user better than what you're writing. Mm -hmm. In this case, if you can reformulate it so that your 500 words are better, then mm -hmm. go with that. Okay. Don't be the school kid that goes like, furthermore, right. as I was seeing, just like to fill in. Unnecessary things. language, yeah. <laughs> And what's kind of the criteria for de determining if something is spammy or auto-generated? So take, for example, if you have 50 location pages for 50 states, mm -hmm. 
and you want to talk about the business, which is largely the same in all those places, but you basically just swap out the name of the city and maybe mm. add a couple na a couple facts about that city, for example. Yeah. How does Google perceive those pages? That's a really tricky one because either they work or they don't, right? right? Um, so generally speaking, if you are using generated content and that is really relevant and, and good and a human sees this and goes, oh, I like this, mm -hmm. uh, you're probably on the right track. Um, that can work for these pages where you have different information for different cities, but it's pretty much like the same kind of mm -hmm. formula behind it. Um, if you have enough like facts around it and there's relevant information in there that mm -hmm. changes city to city, that might really work. Mm -hmm. It might also not. If it's yeah. too similar, and you basically, that's, I, we see that in, in places like Germany sometimes, that there are literally two sides of a river, <laughs> and then they're having like two different pages for this, but they say pretty much the exact same things. Maybe like right. five words are different or something like that, uh, and, and maybe a few numbers here and there, like different number of, of people there or whatever. Um, then we might just consider one uh, duplication of the other and not put it in the index, we might dedupe it and, and uh, eliminate it from the index. Uh, and then there's that not much you can do. If we think it's the same kind of content, then what's the point? Why would we show the same content on multiple URLs? Right. Then we come back to canonicalization, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have information that is good enough and different enough from the other bits and pieces, go for it. Okay. So you would encourage businesses that are in that position where they do need to target mm -hmm. highly localized keywords, yeah. that it's okay to have those pages, but really invest in making them as unique as possible. Make them relevant and helpful right. for the user. The user is the key here, really. And if you are just copying data over from one place to another, is mm -hmm. that that helpful? Mm -hmm. Not exactly. Not exactly. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about how Google treats or how does Google determine what duplicate content is? Mm -hmm. What's the threshold for duplication? I'm actually not sure what the threshold really is, but I know that we are basically fingerprinting the content uh, and the fingerprint is done in a way that allows us to say how similar is it, right? We use def different uh, similarity metrics uh, and figure out, okay, so this is pretty much 95% of this is the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we see, again, we see that in the German speaking countries a lot where um, for instance, a shop operates in Switzerland and Germany and Austria. All mm -hmm. of this is in German and then uh, they have the same product right. and the price is slightly different mm. due to whatever reason. Uh, Switzerland has a different currency, but that's pretty much the entire difference. Maybe they use a few different words because mm -hmm. the, the local dialects are different. Sure. So you have a thousand words in, in each of the product descriptions maybe and like reviews and whatnot. But uh, the price is different, mm. the currency might be different if it's mm -hmm. Switzerland, and there might be like five different words or something like that right. in that. We consider them all to be the same. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually shoot yourself in the foot when you're like trying to canonicalize all of them. Mm. Because we are like, that's not a helpful signal because we determine that what you think is individual pieces of content is actually kind of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but hreflang can then help right. again and make sure that we are surfacing the right version. So we might only be indexing and canonicalizing one of them, mm -hmm. but we will be showing the different uh, versions of these depending on where the person who's searching uh, is Got it. Located. So use hreflang when we there's different dialects and different definitely. regions. Definitely. Yeah. If that's your issue, but if it's literally just the content is slightly different because maybe you have different prices or mm -hmm. something like that, then we, we would consider that the same content. Got it. Thank you so much for being here and talking with me like through all these questions regarding content and what is good content and what's too much and what's not enough content. And uh, this was really helpful and interesting. And um, thanks so much for making it here. Thanks for having me. I think you answered a lot of questions that I have in my clients house. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> Hopefully this will be useful for everyone out there. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you. So the next episode, we have Barry Schwartz visiting and we're going to be talking about SEO community and Google and how we can like, you know, make the relationship better, hopefully. Looking forward to it.